just to look at the badge alone does something to me. You remember the most exclusive club in the world. Rust from the inside out. These are cars with soul. Tremendous power. It's almost human, it's willing. The whole car is a jewel. of the Alpha story are about as unpromising as it's possible to be. The company actually started life, it wasn't even called Alpha, it was called SAID for the Italian Darak Automobile Company. The company was on the verge of bankruptcy. Darak was actually bought out by the Italian co-directors of the company. They renamed the company the Lombardy Automobile Factory, which the initials of which in Italian are ALFA. And the story really began when they recruited Giuseppe Mirosi a surveyor turned automobile engineer to actually design some new cars for them. Morosi's designs put the company on a sound commercial footing and it was beginning to do rather well until the outbreak of the First World War when the car market disappeared virtually overnight. Uh, cars and car parts which had been produced ready for assembly were simply locked away in the warehouses and the company really stared bankruptcy in the face until one of the major financial shareholders, the banker Di Sconto, introduced Alpha to Romeo in the person of Nicola Romeo, a mining engineer and another entrepreneur who was doing very well out of Italian government army contracts. He took over the Alpha factories, switched them to war production and expanded the output of the company 24-fold. He was caught in turn by the end of the First World War and the disappearance of these markets that had provided their salvation. So that all he could do in the short term, although he was no car enthusiast himself, he could see the commercial value of all the pre-war parts that lay in the workshops and he organised the workforce to assemble these to cut into cars which could be sold. Another uh, famous name who joined Alfa at about this time was Enzo Ferrari, who was then a very, very keen racing driver. Ferrari's main value was that he knew Vittorio Giano, a racing car engineer and designer who then worked for the all-conquering Fiat racing team in Turin. And Giano came to Milan to head up the new Alfa Romeo racing development. The result of that uh, collaboration was the Alfa Romeo P2, which was the first Al Alfa Grand Prix racing car to be successful. Giano's main contribution to Alfa history, starting with the P2, was in the engine he designed. That engine in the P2 gave Alfa two World Championship winning seasons. It also provided the inspiration for a series of production cars, because the other half of Nicola Romeo's interest in cars was to provide income for the company. Giano produced a single overhead camshaft version, very, very much detuned, cut down to six cylinders instead of eight, and this produced the 1500, the first of a series of immortal sports cars that people think as perhaps the most classic alphas of all. This car is a 6C super sport fitted with a one and a half litre supercharged engine. It's uh, an FW Styles team car. Um, he was the Alfa Romeo concessionaire in England in, in the 20s. This particular car was in the, the Ulster TT in 29, driven by Campari. It came second overall and uh, won its class in that race. And uh, also uh, raced by Ramponi in the, in the double 12 of Brooklyn, uh, which it won. When the team career had finished, the car went away and had other bodies put on, touring bodies put on. This particular car had this present Zagato body fitted and jazz musician Buddy Featherston Hall bought the car and raced it extensively at Brooklyn's in, in the 30s. When I was a student, I was approached by a friend of mine who wanted me to design and build him a special. And uh, I said it'd take at least two years to get it from the drawing board to completed car. And I said, why not go vintage? And I found this car, I think it was in the 52 copy of Motorsport, and I said, that's your car. Well, when we went to see the car, uh, I could hear this car coming all the way down the road, and the sound of the blower, and oh, it's gorgeous. And he turned around the corner, and uh, there it was. I just fell in love with it. 
And I inspected it for Han Sing, uh, this Chinese friend of mine, and uh, he bought it. It took me two years to persuade Han Sing to sell me the car. And eventually he um, capitulated, and that was 32 years ago. It's a delightful car to drive. It's not an easy car, if you don't know it. The gearbox is a little bit difficult. You have to double the clutch uh, up and down. Um, it's very light. Um, there's a lot of movement. The whole car is moving, yet it feels, and yet it's taut. It's difficult to explain. Um, and you get the lovely sound from the, from the engine and the blur. The whole car talks to you. A car with this sort of history it is a lot of fun to own. You think, my God, Campari was sitting behind this wheel once. Successive models from the 1500, the 1600 and the 1750 were really variations on the same theme. They won sports car races, but the company was still hankering after Grand Prix success because this was the real trump card with the public. It was difficult for Jarno to carry on developing the P2. What was needed was a new design altogether, which he developed in the form of the immortal P3. This car proved so competitive on its first outings, it seemed as if all the money and all the time that had been spent on it was now actually going to put the company at the top of the Grand Prix racing tree. But the company had horrendous financial problems. Once again, they'd spent too much on sporting success and not enough on sound production cars. Hardly had the P3 started to establish themselves on the racing circuit than the company called a complete halt to all racing activities and the cars were wheeled away into a warehouse to be kept in Milan, away from the racing circuits, and everything came to a grinding halt. The company fortunately had one more shot left in the locker. One of the derivatives had been a sports racing version to take over from where the 1750s had left off. This car was entered in a major sports car race at Monza, and it had actually won on its first competitive outing. The cars ever afterwards, in honour of that victory, were to be known as Monzas. This car is an Alfa Romeo Monza. The car was bought in 1933 um, by an Englishman. He was a, a privateer. You could buy it direct from the factory then, worth 1,600 pounds, which was a lot of money. And it was immediately raced throughout the circuits in Great Britain and Ireland and in Europe. Uh, tremendous success it, it, it was. There were only about that time 10 original Monzas. My father bought the car in 1962, when I was born, for an unbelievable 800 pounds. Even then, that was quite eccentric to buy an old banger like this at the time. And he died about 10 years ago, leaving a wonderful collection of cars for us. And uh, this particular car was the car that I took on as my responsibility. This was the Formula One car of its day. It, it, things are different now, because your F1 car, all it does is stay on the racetrack. F1 cars then would do your road races as well as your track races. You had to be a versatile car and a versatile driver. It's very fast depending on your drive ratio, how you set it up. In fact, it can go 140 miles an hour, which is not bad for a car of that age. It has a big fuel tank, 130 litres. I stop filling it up when it gets to 50 quid. But if I filled it up to the top, you can go 400 miles. The accelerator pedal's in the middle, which um, can put you off to start with, and you occasionally go th shooting through the traffic lights if you're not, not careful. It's got a, a, a crash gear box, and that once you handle all these little quirks about it, it is as smooth as butter. Very high torque, very direct steering. You can see the wheels in front of you, and you're on top of the car, and um, it's tremendous power. I'll push it out of the garage, I'll drive it to the racetrack, I'll take the wings off, I'll thrash around, um, hurl it as hard as I can I, uh, 
around the track. And then at the end of the day, I'll drive it home. And, um, you know, the very few thoroughbreds you can actually do that with. It's a, the most fantastic car to own because you remember the most exclusive club in the world. It's uh, the only six really original ones around. A lot of these fantastic, wealthy car collectors will give their eye teeth to have a Monza. I am the first to admit that um, I'm, I'm the luckiest person alive. I want to use it as much as I can. Um, it's a bit of a cliche to say that one's just merely the custodian of it, and uh, it will be passed on to the next generation. No one really owns the Monza, you know, the Monza owns you. The thing that really kept Alfa Romeo going during the remainder of the 30s was in fact um, a dictator, Benito Mussolini, the leader of Ital Italy's fascist government. One of the things that dictators need is prestige. And it seemed clear in the world of the 30s that one very, very useful way of gaining national prestige was winning Grand Prix races. The government, in effect, became a major shareholder, pumped more and more money into the company and changed its priorities completely. Alpha was kept going by the racing team and by more and more armaments contracts for the aero engines that were becoming an increasingly important part of the company's stock and trade. Of course, Alpha's aero engine production was to make the company a priority target once war actually did break out. And by the time that war was over, the company's factories were literally in ruins. By the end of the war, the intention was to move into the mass market to an extent far greater than they'd managed to do before the war. And one of their engineers, Dr. Orazio Satapuliga, had designed a car which was the first Alpha to be mass produced. It was the first monocoque Alpha with an integral body and chassis. It was the first four cylinder twin cam Alpha, setting really a new theme for all the production Alphas right down to the present day. The 1900 really re established Alpha as a major car producer in this enthusiast oriented market. The next car, the Giulietta, took things a whole stage further. The Giulietta was designed almost by accident. Alfa Romeo um, were not used to this sort of volume production and therefore they didn't have the financial backing, etc. So they decided very cleverly to have a, a lottery and award 200 cars. The, the lottery tickets had been dished out and Alfa got their money and they had to name 200 winners. But they had no cars to give them. So, in a flash, in the Italian way, they decided to build sprints as opposed to saloons. And this one in particular is a lightweight 1957 Giulietta Sprint which is quite rare, and I think they only made 750. I've had the car since 1969-70. Uh, um, it was my normal road car, and then I had a bit of an engine problem and put it in storage when I went abroad, and about 1986 or so, I decided to have it restored. My passion for for the Giulietta stems from a long time ago and it basically is the shape. It's totally balanced, it's got flowing lines, it's simple, it's got no frills and it's just exactly right. And everywhere I go with this car, people say to me, what a beautiful car. An old lady of about 60 rushed across the petrol forecourt the other day and said, I love that car. She says, it's one of the most beautiful cars I've ever seen. I do have another Giulietta which I race on the tracks in historic events and um, that is a different kettle of fish to the standard Giulietta in that it's got stiffer springing, heavier anti-roll bars, the engine is a higher state of tune and um, it goes like hell. The car is totally Italian in character. 
every part of it. Its temperament, its style, the way it drives. The engine is just fantastic. 1290cc, all aluminium with wet liners, and um, can be tuned up to 120, 130 brake horsepower, um, and very flexible. You can do anything with it. Beautiful. It's a little jewel. The whole car is a jewel. I'm besotted with it. Just to look at the badge alone does something to me. Whenever you look at Alfa Romeo marketing, you find obviously the sporting characteristics emphasised, but also the technology. It's acknowledged that if you bought an Alfa Romeo, you didn't just buy a car that had sporting pretensions or indeed sporting character, but a car that was well engineered. And in their brochures and general marketing, you do find pictures of the engines, of the suspension, an acknowledgement that a buyer of that car would enjoy understanding how it worked, what it did, rather than just enjoying what it looked like. The one thing that Alpha were always very good at was taking a good design and capitalising on it. The Giulietta eventually became the bigger Giulia and the various versions, the Spider and the Veloce and the larger six-cylinder cars. These really established a golden age for production Alphas where people could buy a car with an almost unique combination of character and performance and looks. The Italian government was undoubtedly delighted with the success of its protégé but a new political factor began to enter its dealings with Alfa Romeo during the 19, late 1960s when it began to see Alfa as a possible solution to a problem of increasing unemployment and unrest in the south of the country. And it was decided that a completely new car should be produced to enter a part of the market that Alfa hadn't been involved with. It was to be produced in Naples rather than Milan where all previous Alfa production had been concentrated. So that the Alfa Sud owes its name because it was a product of Alfa South, Alfa Sud in Italian. They built the factory at Pomilaga in the south and basically employed the peasants from the fields to build them. Part of the problem with the workforce was that having worked in fields on farms, they were used to a three-day week. And uh, obviously Alphas and the government wanted them to work five. The end result was that the factory never worked at anything approaching full capacity and that blighted the commercial viability of the project, even with government money behind it. I first became interested in Alpha Suds when I became an apprentice back in 1979. Thompson and Taylors, who were the original importer of Alphas in the 60s, and having worked on them and spent lots of time around them, it took less than a year for me to have one. My first Sud was a little red 1200 Ti N-Reg, which I owned in total for 10 days, seven of which I spent fixing it. And on the third day of ownership, I hit a very fast Opel Ascona in it, head on, put my girlfriend in the hospital and broke my wrist. This uh, didn't put me off because, well, I've had another 31 since then. The Suds always had a rust problem in the early days, which was probably due to the thin metal used and also the total lack of anti-corrosion treatment of any description. They then attempted to cure it by filling some of the inner panels with foam, which basically retained the moisture and made them rust from the inside out. The rust in the suds that I've owned is usually cosmetic, but um, I did have a back window fall out of one, or a side back window fall out of one on the motorway, coming back from my father-in-law's with 
my mother-in-law and the same girlfriend I nearly killed. And uh, she was actually physically sick when she got home due to all the exhaust fumes and everything that was coming in. So that was, that was well worth the window disappearing down the motorway just to make her ill. It was designed once again as a car for the mass market, a car where performance was important but not the be all and end all of the car. And yet this is a car which established its own racing reputation to the point where a special formula was established in Italian and increasingly European racing for Alfa Suns. They became extremely popular. A combination of qualities that make the Alfa Suns such a great car. Well, it's not the bodywork, that's for, for sure are the engine, gearbox, suspension. You, you, f you feel attached to it all when you've got hold of the steering wheel. It's giving you information all the time. It's almost human, it's willing. You know, if you had a Golf GTI, it's very nice, it's well made, it sits outside, it doesn't rust. It's boring. The Sud has got lots of things going for it, you know. If you've gone a long journey, you get there, you give it a little pat, you know, you just get out of your golf and shut the door and walk away, wouldn't you? It's got real character. My journey to work in the morning would be deadly dull if I didn't have this. I take the wife's Uno sometimes and I think, God, I wish I brought the Sud. By the 1980s, it was clear that the company could no longer carry on on its own account. Fiat, who had by then taken over the rest of the Italian car industry, was seen as the most logical buyer. Here's a company that survived two world wars, three cash crises, two changes of ownership, and the eventual elimination of the dictatorship that kept it going during the 1930s. And yet it looks, on the face of it, as if the Fiat takeover may well be the best thing that could have happened for Alfa Romeo. Most people, even if they're not dedicated Alfa enthusiasts, have, uh, will admit to having a soft spot for the Mark, possibly because it has been hanging on in its teeth for so long. Alfa Romeo's tended to be uh, uh, works of art as opposed to racing tools. Fortunately, sometimes the two combined. I love them. I race them. I drive on the road every day. I fix them. I wouldn't have anything else. Unless you've actually driven one, it's difficult to be sure what people are talking about when they say that these are cars with soul. But any Alpha enthusiast will know exactly what you mean. And that's what makes the mark unique.